When you're dead, you, your bones will literally, you know, you'll be able to fit into a little shoebox. But right now, you're bigger than the shoebox. You know, there, there's a reason for that because you have all this interconnected myofascia, uh, ligaments and everything that's kind of holding you up and giving you a structural integrity. Really, everything that you've been told about diet and nutrition, as you just alluded to, particularly from a mainstream medical perspective, is lies and bullshit. So they want to get you a lifetime of highly processed shit food that causes inflammation in your body that will give you Alzheimer's, high blood pressure and diabetes. And then they want to sell you the medicines to fix those things. Because largely in our society, most people's problems stem from lack of effective, authentic trunk control. Even people who think they've got, you know, ripped up six pack and I give them something to do and they fall, <laughs> yeah, fall yeah, on their face and they're yeah. like, okay it might look good mate but it ain't working that well paris pain welcome to the everyday perspective podcast thanks very much you're Pleasure welcome to be here cheers mate great to have you mate um so physiotherapist strength conditioning coach but but so much more um do you want to tell us what it is you do uh, probably better coming from you than it will from me yeah sure i'll give you a little part of history of me um, and I always get this thing of people saying, you know, which pigeonhole then do you fit into? Mm. <clears throat> and I, yeah, I guess I don't really fit into a pigeonhole. So I wear a lot of different hats, which is why I haven't got any hair left. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I guess where I started, I was always a mover. I mean, we spoke a moment about, a, ago about me not being able to sit still. I will fidget while I'm here. And it was the case when I was at school. You know, this whole concept of uh, shut up and sit down. This is how you're going to learn. It never suited me. I was always, I needed to move around. I, I you know, I, I speak better when I move around, mm -hmm. actually. And I think better when I move around. In fact, everything that I do seems to be better when I'm moving around. So there was a message there for me right from the beginning. So, um really that whole that journey it led me through when I was younger it led me through martial arts I did judo uh, my dad was um, ex-military and he was into you know being outdoors doing stuff and I'm a I'm a 70s child mm -hmm. so um, there was a lot more outdoors doing stuff in those days mm -hmm. you know we were on skateboards and bikes and climbing trees and all sorts so this whole concept you know just being a mover is really my history but I'd sort of uh, I'll give you that the little bit it might be interesting to you but it's, a, it's an interesting story so um, as I became a teenager and then started hanging out with my mates and we we go into town you know Friday night Saturday night the usual story and um, I was never really uh, never really drawn into that alcohol thing you know I mean my mates were and there was uh, there's that culture you go out with your mates you know um, but it was going to the nightclub and dancing that was my thing mm -hmm. okay and so everybody thinks they can dance when they've had a few beers <laughs> but uh, I never used to drink I just used to dance and uh, again I don't know if it still happens but like back in the 70s if you were busting some moves and that you'd either get two things would happen either someone would be yeah dance floor challenge let's let's do this let's go or you know a space would clear and they just let you get on with it mm. and either resent you for it or clap or something you know but <laughs> right very much there was a i don't know it was a bit of a culture doing that and that's what i used to do mm. so i used to go out with my mates friday saturday night and i just dance all night long and um there was a very sort of seminal these seminal moments happen in your life don't they where it's a sort of a, a shade where you get to go up that way or that way and this was one of those because um i was in I was in bands at the time. I was in a, a band and I was front man singer. And um, we were on tour. I was with a different band who sh we shared the rehearsal facility with. And they were a great band, Click Click. You can look them up on the internet. They're still going strong, awesome. Uh, electronic kind of Euro, Euro crash dance band. All that sort of stuff, right? And um, I used to go and watch their rehearsals because I used to just sit in there and they'd get totally engrossed in the music and just start dancing. So they said, look, come and do that on stage. So I did. And we toured in Europe and um, 
there was a day we were in Germany and we were interviewed by some uh, German guys, a little bit like this, you know, doing a kind of radio show interview. And they said, where did you train for contemporary dance? And I went, you what? <laughs> I'm from Luton, mate. <laughs> you know? And they went, oh, you don't know this contemporary dance? And I'm like, no, just, I really don't know what you're talking about. So they said, okay, later we show you. So later on, we went back to their flat uh, like the band and some other people and they were having drinks and that and they put on you know, a nice big kachunk videotape and it was uh, Pina Bausch and uh, Wuppertal Tanztheater and it was like I was a kid sat down in front of a Scooby-Doo cartoon you know I was just completely glued to the screen I was like whoa what is this this is what I want to do and that was my that was my seminal moment of introduction to, you know, movement. But it just the whole, the whole thing, the performance, the, the theatre of the thing, just the intensity, how it drew me in. It was just, wow, I want to do whatever that is, I want to do it. Mm. So a friend of mine who was a drummer in a different band, his girlfriend was American and she was a singer, but she'd also done dance as part of her training. And she said, okay, well, let's send off for some auditions for you. And then I'll teach you a phrase that you go and then you audition, right? So it's exactly what I did. I went up to uh, Coventry uh, Center for Performing Arts and uh, I had an audition, at which point I completely forgot everything that she taught me, mm. <laughs> right? I just went <laughs> blank. <laughs> I mean, there's a panel of five people sitting mm. there, you know, with clipboards and they're like, come in dance for us and they're like okay I wasn't used to that right mm. and so I just put my cassette on <laughs> cassette yeah um, some of us remember those yeah, you're we'll, too we'll way to too uh, no I can remember I, 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 I ish, just, yeah, ish. I've seen it on the <laughs> history channel <Yeah. laughs> what's that video mate <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah good but I put my cassette on and I just improvised and danced around and then they kind of looked at me and said okay do you want to go outside? We'll come and get you in a minute. And they came and got me and Sarah Watley, who is an excellent person. She now heads up the research program for dance uh, of, out of Coventry University at the minute. A wonderful person. She came up to me. She said, look, you've, you've obviously had no training, but um, you've got a natural propensity for movement. Mm. I've never forgotten that phrase. And if there's anything that you can put on my my headstone uh -huh. be, here lies Paz he had a natural propensity for movement <laughs> which in other words means he can't keep still you know he just moves around all the time and so they gave me a scholarship um, a fully sort of funded scholarship and I left my mates in Luton and I moved up to Coventry all on my own and I started going to um, this uh, dance school I did that for two years and then I from that, got a place on the degree at Middlesex University, and then I did my first degree in dance and movement at uh, Middlesex University. And I was okay as a dancer. I wasn't the best in the world. I was pretty good. I had my own particular ways of doing things. So I went off and had a career doing that, which was going pretty good. And then in 1995, I auditioned for probably the best physical theater company in Europe, one of the best in the world, um, at the time called VTOL which is vertical takeoff and landing so that gives you an idea even within their name their kind of physicality mm. I mean it was I always wanted to work for them I auditioned 300 guys turned up mm -hmm. in London and it got down to me and another guy from Ballet Rombe right at the end of the day and I got the job and I was blown away I couldn't believe it fantastic you know I'd worked for lots of other companies mm. but this is the one I wanted mm -hmm. and within <clears throat> three months I busted my knee so I uh, d damaged my ACL it didn't it was partial rupture it didn't need repairing uh, but I completely snapped my medial collateral ligament and then I also managed to split the medial meniscus so I had your nice O'Donnell Hughes triad mm -hmm. but not quite as bad as it could have been I didn't the ACL was okay yeah so that was lucky but it did end that that uh, contract right. because they were on a tight schedule they needed to go on tour yeah. and then they had to let me go and somebody else came in they didn't actually replace me they did the whole thing without me being involved um, <clears throat> and I 
you know, I had some I had some baggage about that for quite a long time. That was yeah. my career window, which evaporated right in front of me. So it took me a while to get my, my head back together. And I did, I, I got surgery on the NHS, but as many subsequently, you know, becoming a physio, many people find they don't really get any good referral for physio. And even if they do, it's like six sessions and it's over loads of time and, and they're not geared up, neither should they be really, they're not geared up to take elite level performers back to where they need to be. Mm-hmm. It's, it's largely a different client group, you know. So I was kind of out in the wilderness, you know, thinking, well, I still got a big fat knee that won't bend very far. What am I going to do? So I started doing my own rehab in the swimming pool and just figuring it out from being guided by my internal voice. Mm-hmm. How, how old were you at this point? Um, I guess I was probably about 22, 24. Four maybe okay. somewhere around there. Okay. I could sit down and figure it out to be accurate. But yeah, I'm no, I was just wondering whereabouts you were. Yeah, at around that point. Yeah, I'd say round about there. And and being injured at that age is a career ender for a dancer. Not necessarily. I mean, it wasn't for me. Yeah. But there was nowhere I could go for somebody to tell me that. And the the sort of input I was getting from physios and other people again were not geared around helping. You know, a professional high level dancer get back to doing that there was you know retrospectively looking back on it what I should have um, been doing is finding the best um, sports physio that she used to work in with elite level footballers rugby players Mm -hmm. and then seeing them but anyway I was skint at that time so that probably wouldn't have helped that much and then also this is the journey that made me who I am now so if I go back and change any of it I'm not I'm not here right now. So, you know, it, it was what it was. Um, so it forced me to kind of, you know, do this rehab. And then, yeah, within within two months, I was auditioning again. And I'd, I'd got another contract and I was back to working professionally. But I was surrounded by people who knew my story. It's a kind of a small world, you know, that was saying, wow, you know, you fixed your knee. Fantastic. You know, I've had this problem with... Blah, blah, blah. You know, would you reckon? And I'd be like, well, you know, maybe. And so we start getting drawn into this, <laughs> helping other people with their their injuries and stuff. And then people were coming back to me saying, oh, mate, that thing that you told me, it's really fixed it. Or, you know, when you push that, it's like sorted itself out. You should do this yeah. professionally kind of thing. So I was going, hmm, okay. I'm not earning very much money as a dancer. I kind of like it. But I'd met the girl who was and still is my wife, uh, was going to become my wife. And uh, with two of us in different dance companies touring different directions around the world, it was really difficult to have some quality time, you know. So we were both thinking, do we still want to keep doing this? Because it's kind of hard to have a relationship. And so for me, the the decision was already, I, I felt like it was already just being mapped out in front of me. Look, okay dancing great you've had a good number of years you've got to this point you've had some great adventures traveled the world maybe it's time to think about this and i always loved science and anatomy and all of that so it seemed like the perfect thing so i did yeah i went off and studied the physio degree at um university of east london which is again a great experience fantastic um fantastic faculty um i learned so much um you know it was brilliant but the one thing that it very quickly became apparent to me, which again, just didn't sit right with me, was that none of these people really knew about movement. I mean, certainly you got, you know, technical uh, books about biomechanics and all sorts of things, but they were very sort of dry, um, sciencey ways of analysing the human gait with heel strike and then this happening and then this reflex happening and the Achilles uh, tendon stuff. You know, I mean, and I, I thought this is all very interesting, but but when do we get to the bit where we look at movement and how bodies work dynamically? We never did because it's not really, still isn't. Uh, certainly in this country anyway, it's not part of medicine. In fact, you know, a part of the problem, I think, with medicine, with physios 
in general, not having a pop at physios particularly, but I'm saying, like the medical model, you go to see someone with a shoulder problem yeah. and they will look at your shoulder. Mm. They won't, there isn't this idea that you step back and you look at the whole unit, which might then point towards why there's a shoulder yeah. problem. Do you find that, that degrees that cover things like sport rehabilitation and sports therapy cover that more because it's, it's not such a wide range of things to cover off? Well, not ever having done one, mm. um, I can only sort of respond on a position of guys that I've worked with that have done that yeah. route. And I think that, you know, like most things, depends where you study, depends who your lecturers are, depends on their interests and experience. Mm. And it depends on you as an individual, mm. uh, your background, how you see things, yeah. you know. So I would say that most of the time as I've gone through my career and I've employed physios or have employed uh rehabilitators or you know i mean these days now i work internationally so i go to other countries and i talk to uh, you know physios and other people working with elite sports people um and and they vary enormously again more down to individuality rather than the 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 actual training because yeah, sure. even i mean you're probably aware but there's um i remember working with some South Africans and then they have a role called a kinesiologist mm. and I was okay that's interesting what's that all about then and so they they kind of look at um, yeah movement but again you know and I can't speak for everybody in South Africa who's a kinesiologist but certainly the people that I um, interacted with were, were breaking it down into more of a sort of a medical model well, and again, a largely antiquated medical model. Like, um, we'll we'll dig into that a little bit mm. as we go forwards about how I have a different perspective on that, mm. um, and also how over, say, the last mm, decade, fifteen years, maybe again, generally things have changed due to a few key individuals coming into the field and bringing tools and materials with them to kind of expand people's minds and say look you know you need to think about things in a more connected way mm -hmm. so we'll dig into yeah. into some of that but to finish off my bit about me and then you can shut me up is uh so i did i graduated as a physio and then immediately left london i wanted to come back down to the southwest because i'd always come down here me and my wife for surfing and uh, holidays like people do. Um, and so I, uh, yeah, I, my first job after being a physio was to go to Derriford and I did all my junior rotations there. Mm -hmm. I got snapped up by um, the MOD and went and worked HMS Drake, HMS Rally. Um, and also at the same time, I started part-time with Plymouth Albion and then ultimately went full-time you know, so just even in this local area, there's a, I have a whole bunch of things that going back to 2002 um, that I've been involved in. Yeah, I think you did a little bit of work with the um, Middle Martial Arts Academy as well, I remember. Um, sort of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and martial arts. Yeah, I've been, I've had, you know, I dip in and out. Yeah. I still do. Mm. I still have guys that come and see me, BJJ guys, all sorts of people come and see me. But Really, it was largely through my relationship with Plymouth Albion yeah. and uh, a great guy who was there at that time, James Owen, who was the strength coach yeah. there. Um, and Jim Bob, as he's known, he's now down at, he's gone back to his roots, really. I think he's down back down at Cornish Pirates. Yeah. And um, there's no doubt that Jim Bob was a huge influence on me because um, in some ways, I do feel this as I've gone through my career, actually, I've been a bit spoiled because I've had the good fortune to just kind of meet and work with people who are not typical, they're atypical. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of gone, oh, this is great. And then I go somewhere else and I have an expectation of that kind of interaction or level of knowledge or depth of knowledge and it, it's not been the same. So I would say with Jim Bob, I, I was very um, you know, lucky that, that Jim Bob was in that place coming from a completely different direction you know a um you know a very good rugby player played all of his life then he was trained to be strength coach he was working at it but he was at that point where as we all know you know i mean there's more injuries in rugby 
Um, okay. When I say there is, I'm talking, if you just rewind, you know, 10, 15 years ago rather than now, because a lot's changed. Mm -hmm. But back then, there were way more injuries coming out of the engine room, mm -hmm. out of the weights room, than there was on the pitch. Was it really okay? Oh, yeah. There'd be a different kind of injury. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, out on the pitch, it would be collision trauma, yeah. you know. But you don't get a massive collision trauma every game. If you mm -hmm. did, you know, rugby would be shut down overnight and you know you wouldn't have a squad for very long right but there were more injuries of a different type which is overuse repetitive strain injuries you know um all that sort of stuff that would come out of the weights room and to be honest with you even when i was studying on my physio degree uh, my wife needed surgery because she was you know still dancing then she needed surgery on her foot and her company had good insurance so she was sent to a private physio, a guy called Dave Pierce, who happened to be WASP's head physio at that time. And um, he's an Aussie. I got on really well with him, and uh, he showed me how to do some manual mopes on my missus. And then we went back, and he said, oh, you've done a great job there, mate. You should get into this. You know, so more pressure on me to, to, to be a physio. And he said, why don't you come down and spend some time with me down at WASP? So I did. Um, and I got to, you know, do a bit of hands-on and do all sorts of stuff and have great experience when back in the days of Lawrence Delalio being there and uh, oh, all sorts, loads, loads of players, but it was a great experience for me. And even then walking in, I can remember him laughing at me because I'd, I'd been looking at some of the gym work and, uh, you know, a classic, <clears throat> classic thing of somebody back squatting a huge amount of weight I can't remember. I think it was, uh, I think it was Trevor Leota, who's, you know, his thighs are as big as my body. I mean, he's a huge, huge unit. Um, he used to intimidate the opposition by running out for the warm up and just banging into the uprights and getting them to vibrate and then just bang them and they vibrate. You could see <laughs> the opposition yeah, like, looking at him. Oh, he's going to be doing that to me in a minute. <laughs> I'm not happy about this. Uh -huh. Um, but he was, he was very much, I'd say, an atypical Islander. Like, he was robust. He was solidly built, and he was a really nice bloke. Mm. But as soon as he was over that white line, he'd tear all your limbs off and <laughs> throw you to the crows, you know. But um, he was a lovely guy. And I was watching him do this back squat, and as usual, you know, you get these guys, and they're completely curved over thoracic kyphosis jamming the bar out on the back of their neck and I'm looking at it just, oh, just looks real bad even though it's shifting huge weight so then he comes in and Dave's going yeah have a look at him because he's always having problems with this that and the other so I just go alright I'm going to assess your thoracic extension etc mobility there ain't none there's none and I'm like okay so that's why he can't extend his back with a bar on it he can't even extend his back anyway so putting a bar on it just is making all of this stuff worse. Mm -hmm. And it's only gonna end one way, in injury. Mm -hmm. And that was even an early experience of me bringing my movement and understanding of bodies and alignment and et cetera into an environment where I didn't really have any knowledge of it. But by the time I was at Albion, I did. Mm -hmm. And as I say, Jim Bob was of the same mind. He's, he's looking at me going, these guys are getting injured, but I've got to do these things in order to to build their bodies because they need this muscle for protection so mm -hmm. they've got to have it help me you know can we work together on this because you know about movement you know about this so we started to systematically go through everybody and screen them and figure out what let, you know let's do an MOT let's just step back and say where are your problems because if we don't sort those problems out putting an additional burden load on that just enhances that compensatory behavior mm -hmm. you know like if if you're if you're struggling to carry a heavy weight and you're using all the wrong muscles to achieve that putting more weight on doesn't fix it mm -hmm. it just makes it worse mm -hmm. right so me and Jim Bob worked intensively on that we had a, a I enjoyed that period of time I think I learned so much with that interaction coming from two very different schools of thought mm -hmm. um, but having this common ground where where we met up and in fact it was James Owen who introduced me to the work of Grey Cook and this uh, 
seminal study, um, Athletic Body and Balance, mm -hmm. um, which I think came out in like, I'm not sure, about 2001, I think it mm -hmm. came out. And that really was, it was mind blowing. It was mind blowing for me, but it was also something which was, um, like nobody really knew about it at the time. I, you know, Jim Bob, testament to him and his desire to go, there's gotta be a better way. Um, and had discovered the work of Great Cook and put me in, and you know, the moment I took this book and started to read it, I thought, here we go. Here's another one of those moments where you're, you're, you're getting something put in front of you for a reason. Mm -hmm. And the reason is this was the first time not so much in this book, but what it leads to, which is Gray Cook's um, movement screen, the functional movement screen, the FMS, yeah. which you guys probably heard about. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the first time really in, the, in this sports sector, but even coming out of dance, that I'd been made aware that there was this kind of concept really that you could go through some kind of screening mm -hmm. type stuff that would help you target and identify where movement restrictions or weaknesses mm -hmm. were in this individual. So we started to employ that. And, um, you know, that we did the best we could. But the thing about Albion at that stage, I think maybe even worse now, but I mean, and that was at a stage where actually they were doing pretty good. You know, we used to play against Dexter Chiefs and Pirates to see who's going to win all the time. It was Albion pretty good in those mm -hmm. days. Um, but there wasn't much money. And certainly there was never, and often in, uh, you know, elite, even the best elite sporting environments, um, again, a bit different these days, uh, the least amount of money would be allocated to the medical mm -hmm. department or the yeah. sort of medical S&C mm -hmm. type stuff. It's like, you know, nah, we don't really, you know, we don't appreciate the value of that. There wasn't the education. I think coaches mm -hmm. nowadays and athletes as well, much more switched on. So a lot of money um, and the knowledge of prevention is better than yeah. cure, all of that, all of that. So there's a lot more money available. Back in those days, we were the ones really trying to introduce that. We were going, look, there's a better way. If we can stop this happening, you don't have to spend the money on surgery. Yeah. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> How are you going to do that? Well, <laughs> we're trying to figure it out. But the FMS was the first real tool that we had that enabled us to feel like we could get somewhere because it came with some validity. Mm. And, um, you know, yeah, it was easy to, uh, to apply and it gave us pieces of information that we could make sense out of. Yeah. Did you, get, did you get a lot of pushback from the club? Like when you were like saying all these different ideas and things like that, were they just like no, really like no, or were they they inclusive in that? No, I think you know back then I'm working with Graham Dor. Um, I don't know if you ever met Dorsey no. or I mean, very anybody who's listening to this that knows Dorsey knows why I'm hesitating to find a good description of him because he's the sort of person that you know, you love to bits, like uh, my memories of him and every one of us that ever worked with him, we love him to bits mm -hmm. and we have great respect. But he, he would be very didactic in his approach. You know, he, and basically he wouldn't really care what we did mm. as long as he had the, the guys. As the, as the outcome. As long yeah. as the guys are on the pitch, <laughs> yeah. doing the job, yeah. do what you like. You know, yeah, okay. strap yeah. a crystal to the head and get them <laughs> running around the block. <laughs> I've, I've got them Someone's done that somewhere. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. Well, I live in Tottenham, mate. So yeah, you know, there you go. But, how, uh, about, um, how about the players? Especially rugby lads, because they're just used to running into so people. in that culture as well. Now you're getting yeah. them to start training movement. How did that go down initially? No, I think, you know, um, it's a good point. Because looking back on it, I guess, you know, my naivety, again, coming out of a dance movement uh, world, where everybody's totally kind of, oh man, you feel this? And like, well, yeah, release the shoulder. You know, it's just the language you use and the concept about, which is another good point. I'm glad you brought me onto it because it's a thing that I really love about how things have developed, which is for us dancers, training, that kind of thing. It's very much an internal journey. Mm -hmm. It's about where I, like if I say to you now, where are your feet? Can you feel the bottom of your feet? You know, is one tilted? Have you got both flat on the floor? But at the moment, uh, a moment ago, you weren't thinking about your feet at all until I brought your attention to it. And now where are your shoulders? Where's your back? What are your hands doing? How have you crossed your arms? Did you make a conscious decision to have those fingers 
out and those ones curled was that subconscious you know and what the dance training does is it takes you down a route of consciously being aware of everything that you do so it's an internalization which goes and do you need to do that thing in order to say move from a to b so you learn to identify um unrequired tension you know so like a classic example when people are looking a bit blank when i'm talking about this stuff at conference or whatever is i'll say we've all seen it because if you get somebody who is who's moving unconsciously or someone who's not trained or someone who doesn't have body awareness to lift something heavy they'll do this and what they'll do is you know they'll brace their scapular stabilizers by just getting upper traps in there and they'll just be upper trap dominant because it's the easiest thing to do to say to solve that physical problem whereas someone who's more aware will go no i can stabilize my scapula i want to take the load down through a different kinetic pathway and i don't need upper traps involved at all you know so a, a dance training that kind of movement training that body awareness takes you through that route of analyzing all the time everything you're doing all the time now when you obviously get into the world of sports usually there's um, an empirical objective which is driving it not an aesthetic objective so go faster jump higher lift more etc etc it's a number you can measure it or you've got a stopwatch it's there's empirical so it's an external journey and to answer your question you know the rugby guys were used to that external journey and what i started to introduce is this internal journey about thinking can you feel like where your shoulders are and like you know and lots of different strategies you can use for that hands-on mm -hmm. guiding people through it's like working with clay and you're kind of crafting people even through the movement you're kind of guiding them patterning it you can use you know kinesio tape or just lots of different things but the short answer is no, not really. You didn't get any pushback. People wanted to do that because fundamentally they wanted to stop being injured. <laughs> yeah. I want the shoulder pain to go away. Right. Then let's stop you lying down on the couch, getting it poked and rubbed and released. And because even if that's working, mm -hmm. it's addressing the symptoms, not the cause. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to shift this to let's look at your kinetic chain, let's look at your movement, mobility, stability, control. And then we'll fix that so that the thing that you're overusing to get the job done can do less work because the load is being shared by multiple units. Mm -hmm. And fundamentally, that's what fixes things. Mm -hmm. I'm not denying that there are obviously pathologies that come out of things, but even with a pathology, even if someone has a rotator cuff tear or they've shredded you know, their long head of biceps through years and years of heavy lifting and obviously one of the roles that the long head of biceps does is to stabilize the glenohumeral joint um, which is why it's a bit unfair that you know bicep curls have got such a bad rep because actually part of your shoulder rehab and maintenance should be bicep curls because it's going to help stabilize your shoulder so yeah. so it's fine to do them yeah. prevention is definitely better than cure isn't it which it is. i met you years ago when i was playing football i um i used to do a lot of weights you know, like a, just like a little gym rat, just being there in the gym doing weights. But I played football at not a bad level, and then uh, landed on my shoulder. Funny, dislocated it, and it was it was partially to do with just the mobility in my shoulders were just terrible, mm. terrible. It was just a big unit, but I, I had no flexibility or movement. So someone like you, and, and even in football or in any sort of sport, you know, I probably wouldn't have had the injuries. I had to end up retiring mm. through injury because of things like that. Just where I didn't I didn't really use any flexibility work until my 30s well until I was about 30 and then from those injuries mm. it's encouraged me to do it from then but I've never done it before never even thought of it especially in football and the heartbreaking thing is that that is a very common story yeah 100% still is yeah, yeah it still I is mean, yeah. I'm like it with my clients now I always you know yeah. always talk to them about so many different things I always things feel like it's, it's worse to some extent in, in sports that require a higher level of skill acquisition as well because the athletes just want to do the skill, skill acquisition they don't necessarily want to sort of look after the body as well. And that, that was why I was asking about the rugby thing. That's, I guess it's more of a, I guess that old school hard man culture of just clattering people. But I think there's other sports like maybe Brazilian Jiu Jitsu where it's so, it's so, it's, there's so much skill acquisition involved with that. 
time off the mat is time lost developing those skill acquisitions or acquiring those skills. Um, so, so thinking about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, because a lot of our listeners currently are um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioners at various levels, and it sounds like your approach is almost almost tailor made for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because yeah, that's a sport that does require a combination of, of flexibility and and a little strength as well. So, thinking about a Jiu Jitsu athlete. I think you said you work with a couple. Kind of, what's the balance with with you know sort of mobility work and, and strength? Um, and actually, just to change that question a little bit, it might be better to ask, I guess, what your definition of movement is as well, because we've touched on it quite a lot. But I think a lot of people might have different perceptions of what movement actually is. So let's start there. What does movement actually mean to you? Yeah, you, you're not going to get that. You're not going to get the uh, here's a here's a three word answer to that question. Mm. Um, but what I can offer you is, um, again, drawing from experiential things. And I, I, there's a phrase that Gray Cook started to use um, because he was attacked quite a bit in the American culture. I mean, I think it was Mike Boyle that started to refer to the FMS as the fictional movement screen. Okay. <laughs> just stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, they just started this whole beef mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. And I just thought it's a bit unfair because all the guy's trying to do is to raise perception and awareness that if you, if you physically, kinetically screen somebody's movement, mm-hmm. you know, if, you, if someone's got ridiculously tight hamstrings and you never pick that up and you just put them, plug them into a performance development program you're only going to find out about that problem when it's too late when they've ruptured a tendon or whatever whatever you know so that's all the guy was trying to do was just to say look you know do the mot first find out what you're working with and address significant imbalances Mm -hmm. before you start loading that system up again whoops so i don't think there's there's a simple answer to the movement but what um what Grey Cook started to do is just say authentic, authentic movement patterns, which is kind of like, I don't know, it's on the way to providing an answer, but but there isn't really an answer. I mean, I can look at anybody's movement at any time, no matter what they're doing, and pick up loads and loads of signals about them. Some people do that from an overlay of psychological profiling. And so, as you're well aware, you know, your body posture, what you do with your hands, what you do with your face, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I mean, if we're playing poker, we're all going to be stony faced. And, you know, so we know there's that stuff out there. So even on micro uh, movements, they call them, there's a whole lot of stuff um, that we're picking up on subconsciously. I mean, there's a great book. Can't remember who wrote it. You might know. Uh, It's called Blink. No, Blink, it's a great book. Um, It talks about that. Basically, our ancestors didn't kind of hang around for 20 minutes figuring out whether or not you were going to kill us and take all our food when you appeared on the doorstep of the tribe. Mm -hmm. They made that decision in microseconds. Mm -hmm. So you're reading people. And again, if you want to relate it to BJJ, you know, as a as a direct confrontation, you know, against an opponent, particularly in a in a match, you're picking up loads of signals. You know, now people try to sell you a story, you know, because they'll do certain things with their body or whatever. But the really high successful kind of practitioners of any fighting style or whatever, they already know whether they're going to beat this guy or girl, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, because they have received either either consciously or subconsciously yeah. the information that they require. Mm-hmm. So we're dealing with that in a very kind of in a very small and a perhaps a bit more obvious way. Mm-hmm. So we're not really looking for micro things. My my whole philosophy, you know, as I try and train people to, to change their attitude and in, in what they're doing, is look for the big things. You know, I mean, look for the big things and look for the obvious things. So anybody that I work with, whether they're an elite athlete or whether they're a member of the public, we always go through the same process, which is that everybody gets screened. Everybody has to do a kinetic screen. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's the rule, because if you ain't screening, you are just pretending. Mm -hmm. okay? and you're likely to not really help them, but give them 
<laughs> additional problems or whatever. So what I often find working with uh, guys from BJJ, like often it will be people that will come to me because they've got an injury. Mm. And then I say, look, you know, my shoulder's knackered often shoulders um, or but it can be other bits and then we'll have a look at that but as part of that process even though I'm focusing on what they want I've still got to open that out and look at that whole kinetic unit and how that shoulder blade shoulder blade shoulder um, whole shoulder control system plugs into the trunk mm -hmm. and even then what the trunk does in order to allow that kinetic unit to work so you know we're going to target yes we're going to target your rehabilitation i'm going to give you what you want but i'm also going to expand it out a bit and say you know there's these issues that we picked up on and etc and i guess ultimately i'll try and talk them into when we get to the right point having a screen mm -hmm. because then we're going to pick up all these imbalances mm -hmm. i mean this this little thing here is is like the best illustration of that uh, the book that it's standing on, actually, There's Anatomy Trains by Thomas Myers. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But that's another sort of publication that came out um, about 2001. And what this guy is, he's a, he's a clinical anatomist. Um, so he teaches anatomy and then he dissects bodies for, um, you know, uh, photos that they're going to use in teaching scenarios, right? That's his job. And then he got to a point in his career where he's gone, ah, I have to just tell everybody that it's not that <laughs> way. So, you know, a bicep isn't just on its own and a quadricep and a anything isn't just like a packet of chicken that you buy shrink wraps from the supermarket. It's actually in this whole myofascial connection, some of which start, you know, at the top at the back of the head go over the top of the head go down the front across the body into the big toe on the opposite side and looking in this book what he does for us is he he dissects the bodies and he takes us through um like drawings of how the interaction of these um my fascial chains work mm. now it's not just so much that you know these things are all connected but it's also about how we think the body works because people think it works in a different way than it actually does it's hydraulic you know when the nerves initiate a muscle contraction that compresses fluid and the fluid creates the stiffness not just in that muscle but through this whole interconnected chain so you've got to think of it as like you know one of the arms on the uh, an excavator and that's all just pumps with hydraulic fluid making that it's extremely strong mm -hmm. you know it's incredibly strong that's how we work you know mm -hmm. we're not some floppy kind of creature that just has little neural impulses like it's solid kind of pumped up fluid mm -hmm. inside of us that gives us our strength and stability and control the nerves are all in there fine tuning all that system that hydraulic system and once you get your head around that and you look at these myofascial trains, is what he calls them. He calls them trains, not chains. He says these are trains and where they are fixed to the bone are stations. Okay. It's just his yeah, you know, just his way of terminology. That, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So think of it how you like. I still use the old school kind of phrase of chain because to me it's a chain of movement. But anyway, within those, the, the way that the, all of those intrinsically work, gives us our um, structure, our structure. Because when you're dead, you, your bones will literally, you know, you'll be able to fit into a little shoebox. Mm -hmm. But right now you're bigger than the shoebox. You know, there, there's a reason for that because you have all this interconnected myofascia, uh, ligaments and everything that's kind of holding you up and giving you a structural integrity. Now that's referred to in architectural terms as tensegrity. So the tension gives you the integrity of the structure. And that's why we can have pop-up tents and all of that, mm -hmm. even though it's made from, you know, a little bit of fabric and some bendy sticks, put it together in the right way and you get a nice rigid structure. Mm -hmm. That's how the human body works. And this sort of baby's toy, it used to have those moving things so it rattled, but I start to get annoying, so I, <laughs> I bit them off. <laughs> but anyway, this illustrates that principle 
so again, if we if we work with this new way of looking at the body, how it moves, how it's put together, we can see that trauma to I don't know the right shoulder or the limb sets up a different relationship in that tension. You said you fell over and you landed on your shoulder, yeah. and then you know from that injury you'll have inflammation, and that inflammation will, will make you know, what people like to refer to as scar tissue, but you can call it adhesions or whatever. But rather than this nice springy interaction then happening there, it's now got adhesions. It's kind of stuck. And so that means that that's changed subtly. I don't know if you could see it, but yeah. subtly changed the tensions throughout a whole lot of this chain. So the interactions of any one bit of your body can affect so much more of yeah. the rest of it. Which is either quite frightening to you or very enlightening in the sense that you say, I explain so much, you know, because like you said, shoulder injury, yeah. but actually that could be popping out with a, a slight dysfunction. You go, my left knee, it was a right shoulder injury, but my left knee has been playing me up for ages. But that's because, you know, the dysfunction has shifted you across and now you've changed that sort of balance in the web. Mm. So That's fascinating, isn't it? You never think of it like that, oh dear. Mm. But yeah, these I mean I've I'm coming in, I knew I was gonna say a lot. This is great. Because mate. it's, it's, it's well, that's, that's why it's I'm not really it. saying anything. I'm just taking <laughs> it in, mate. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no I'm worries. About school. I love it. <laughs> what I mean is, is, I mean, I do a lot of speaking at conferences and things like that because people ask me to come yeah. talk, and then I do, and then I watch the room just kind of glaze over as people are going, whoa. It's like, <laughs> okay, let's take a 20 minute break and you can digest that. But <laughs> yeah. more to the point, I will give you the, the references and, and things that you can attach to this. Mm. And then people can click on that and go to it and look at it and go, it's a process of self-education. This is not secret stuff. It's out there. And I think once you dive into it, it, it just, you know, starts to fill you. You feel empowered and enlightened and you begin to understand the body. So off the back of that, once you understand that this kind of myofascial interaction and this kind of balance of the web needs to be there for complete sort of, body balance function then um you can see how if you're analyzing someone's movement and you saw some dysfunction in that movement that that would immediately bring you back to the web and then you'd be looking at that web thinking okay which part of this web is causing this problem and you start to dig into it mm -hmm. and if you look at the work of mark comerford then uh, he's got a whole bunch of stuff out there. I mean, again, this is decades ago, but it's still all relevant. Mark Comerford, kinetic um, control. Mm -hmm. There was a whole principle of retraining bodies and hands-on stuff and changing neural stimulus to downregulate the tone and you know, change that, that balance. Mm -hmm. So in a way, and this is what I like to try and get across to, to physios and other practitioners, this kind of stuff doesn't undermine anything you do. In fact, it just brings a different kind of model for you to put your stuff on. So when you're sticking your thumb in someone, it's not, you know, maybe doing what you thought it was doing, whatever, did you ever even think about what it was doing? You know, sometimes no. But then people are going, well, it's a myofascial release. Yeah, well, what does that mean? Mm, okay. So it takes us back to how the nerves set the tone of the muscles and contractile tissues, which are then obviously going to set the amount of that hydraulic compression element that you've got in there. So, you know, if you've, I don't know, it might be the difference between like sensory, if you get, you want a wetsuit, right? Put a wetsuit on and it, you can feel it kind of restricts your movement. Mm. All right. And so if you've got a wetsuit on one arm and you don't have a wetsuit on the other, those two arms are not going to be the same. And so how we look at how this structure, how this sort of interconnected web works with the body is that things like neural, too much neural um, information, too much neural stimulus is going to increase the tone and restrict that pattern of movement, change the way it's moving. And that's why you can do your myofascial release with your thumb or with your ball or with whatever, whatever, change that neural outflow. And you start to unlock that pattern of movement and it starts to want to go back like this thing to its default setting. Mm -hmm. 
you are born to be a body in balance. The only reason you're out of balance is because something is preventing you. Mm -hmm. Get rid of that prevention and it goes back to being in balance. Mm -hmm. I guess the big thing is just finding out that balance and where it's wrong. But it's that's it. finding out where the restrictions are and what's going on. But that's the point. If yeah. you have a screening protocol that you employ that starts to lead you down that path, it, it starts to become apparent to you. You know, you do it for a it's decade awesome. and you'll just look at someone doing anything. <laughs> I mean, I work with swim coaches. I mean, I've built a reputation now for, you know, after being Ben Proud's gym coach and Reuters and uh, Laura Stevens, a load of others. So I've, I've been part of some very high profile swimmers journeys and um, worked with some great coaches. And the thing I love about swim coaches is they have amazing eyes. I mean, they'll be watching and they'll say, yeah, look, you see how that, like he's pulling across with the right arm as he's into the catch position and then he's not rotating that. And you kind of watch for a bit. Sometimes even you have to take, you know, some video of it and go and watch it and then go, yeah, right. I do yeah, see that. Do see that? Yeah. It's real small, yeah. but that's their speciality. You know, and going back to what you were alluding to with um, skill acquisition, and repeated, repeated, repeated stuff. Well, that's one of the things that drags that system out of balance. Mm -hmm. But then also on top of that, the guys, whether they're a swim coach, golf coach, whatever, they've got the eyes for that sport specific thing where they're going, you know, as you swing through, you're dropping that shoulder or whatever. So if you're a, if you're a person like I am, whatever hat you're wearing, uh, you know, gym coach, physio, whatever, but if you're working with it, you need to work with that coach. You need to work with that sport specific coach. You n need to learn to see through their eyes. That's really weird. You say that um, Kenny's always about that. And he, Kenny always talks about um, feeling the, the, the person, the jujitsu, like he says, you can feel what's happening before you've actually got to do it. And he's like, just relax, feel your way through it rather than like forcing your way through it. Good posture, good movement, energy balance, all that type of thing. And he, he really does, in fairness to him, drive that home all the time, all the time. And it's, it's a hard one for people to understand. Mm. Um, I think coming from like a fitness background, I feel like I, the posture and the feel, I understand it a little bit more just through movement of, of doing what we do. But I think if you're completely out of that and then coming into that like you said being aware of your body being aware of movement yeah. is really hard yeah it's a funny one because I've done martial arts for years I mean some more movement based numbers so boxing right through to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I guess I've you know I've almost got the blinkers on now because I've done it for so long <laughs> that I've and I don't think my movement's terrible for, for someone who's done Brazilian Jiu Jitsu for as long as I have it's really bad it's why I got injured when you, so I saw you many years ago but um I think for the everyday person who isn't involved with martial arts, who sits at a desk, like where do you even fucking start with something like that? Because they're, they're so jammed up. Start with the fundamentals, though. That's it. Start with the fundamentals. Mm. And, and often the fundamental is, I mean, you've got to have a, a systematic approach to all this. Otherwise, you're just running around like a, a nearly graduate physio going, oh, they've got so many things wrong with them, I don't know where to start. Mm. So the starting point is always start with the trunk. Yeah. Start there. Because largely in our society, most people's problems stem from lack of effective, authentic trunk control. Mm. Even people who think they've got, you know, ripped up six pack and I give them something to do and they fall, <laughs> fall yeah, on their yeah. face and you're yeah. like, okay, it might look good, mate, but it ain't working that well, yeah. you know, and it's about the functional um, aspects of it. Mm. And, you know, there's a whole load of stuff you can do with that. Because if you don't get that sort of trunk foundation sorted, you can't clip on proximal joint, you know, scapular complex, hips. You can't clip them on like your little action man. You can't clip them on and expect them to work well. Mm -hmm. You've got to start start in the middle, you know, yeah, and, and work out. That's yeah. the only way to do it. So people have different philosophies. Some people I know, I've worked with start with feet. Mm -hmm. you know, but a lot of the stuff I do and the way I think about movement is I'm not always on my feet. So I interact with the floor in many, many different ways, different body parts, you know, so, you know, but yeah, where you start often is start with trunk, trunk control, all sorts of stuff, which is why simple strategies, I mean, 
favorite tools? Ask me that question. What's the favorite tools you like to use <laughs> in your daily practice? That's an easy one to answer. Uh, there's kettlebells and um, suspension trainers. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll use loads of that. So again, anybody that I'm working with that comes to me and says, I want to work with you, I want you to, you know, be my coach, train with you. I go, okay, fine. We do the screening. And then from the screening, we go into what we call our foundations program, which is usually six to eight weeks. And even guys that had just come to see me for injury or, you know, we, we spoke a little bit before about the, um, you know, 40 to 60 something blokes that have this sudden life. It was a crisis, but it's a moment of shit. <laughs> the sands are dribbling through the egg timer. Uh, I want to sort myself out, get in better shape. Then often what they'll buy from me is my, you know, six week um, foundations package. And the reason for that is because that's what it's designed to do. You get a screen, then we look for these obvious things. It might be mobility, stability, or strength. And strength in this context relates to, you know, trunk integrated strength for certain things. So it relates a lot more to calisthenic type stuff, mm -hmm. you know, so it's body weight things. Mm -hmm. Because you get that right, then you can start shoving weight on it. But if you don't get that right, again, you're going to just compensate. Mm -hmm. So they'll do the six week program um, and, and then they'll, yeah, they'll be in a much better position from that foundation. Just build your foundations first and then put whatever it is that you're doing on the top of that. And as part of that foundations, we cover nutrition. So we can, we can talk about that if you want. And we also cover um, psychological aspects mindset things like that yeah yeah let's get let's get into both of those things then because we, we've talked a ton about movement so let's get into some of the other bits as well before we do can i just move you in a little bit mate in yeah like that. Come, just come closer to me mate. Yeah. as creepy right. as i am i just move you that's in it, that's fine <laughs> <laughs> so when i'm close enough <laughs> that's it yeah so let's get into some of those i told other you I'd, I'd move i'll be back there in a minute <laughs> oh, you swing a little bit. i didn't yeah. oh, <laughs> see this oh i can't sit still if i'm sitting on a chair right I don't care if I go out shot for this one, but people say to me, yeah, but you've got to sit on chairs, haven't you? And I'll go, yeah, you can, but you can sit on the chair like this. <laughs> and, you, and you're still on the chair, yeah. but now I'm actually squatting, so I can, I can do this for a bit. Are you more uh, comfortable then? Will you stay more not still? That, yeah, I mean, I'm comfortable, but in a minute I'll, I'll move again and I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll move and I'll move. So I might as well just, you yeah, know, stay out of water and sort of put up with it and you'll have to keep... <laughs> Put a piece right. of string on there. That's what I was going to say. We could tie a bit of rope. Yeah. Just what need. <laughs> piece know, of elastic, so I kind of. You know when people come in those old shops and they have got the string with the bell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just one of those. Just every time my leg, mate. If you go far enough, wear rings. We get back in. Um, I do my best. But yeah, just, just, yeah, just there, mate. It's fine. Um, yeah. So that, let's chat about the nutrition and the psychology then, because I know now I've done some training around um, injury rehabilitation, and uh, uh, nutrition wasn't a huge component, but I having done other training feel it is but certainly psychology is a huge component but that's that's good nutrition and, and tell us about what your thoughts are on that i know you've got a, a very particular type of diet yourself is mm. that something you tend to encourage other people to do or is it you know do you, do you tell us what's the approach yeah i think that in the same way that there is not one <laughs> what are the best three abdominal exercises paris for swimmers or uh, and i always say which particular dead bug person. by a dog yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> look at men's health they'll tell you yeah, you know like it was big three the reality is it's the three exercises that person could do the most effectively the ones that they go Jesus that one hurt me and you go good that's the one you should do <laughs> you know not the other four that you went yeah they're alright you know and so again and I use that sort of men's health thing as a sort of slightly derogatory term but you know it, it, it sort of for me exemplifies how you know one size fits all this whole off the shelf philosophy blah 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 it's very convenient mm. but largely it's just a lot of bollocks mm. you know and, and what you get paid for when you're working with elite athletes is very much bespoke programs that fit them that's why it's expensive and, and often that's why they achieve more because they're tick in the box in minute detail mm -hmm. so the, bringing that into the the world of nutrition 
there's a couple of things that you've got to get your head around. And one is that, you know, we're all snowflakes. So all of us are different. There's not any one of us on this planet that is exactly the same as any other. Okay. So that means that there is, there's a bell curve that people are in. There's outliers either end, but you know, largely everybody's in the middle and most stuff gets thrown at that middle kind of bell curve. Right. Um, within the things that make us different, probably the most important thing that makes us different is your microbiome. Okay, so the gut bacteria, the gut flora that you've got inside your gut is probably going to be, you know, very similar. I'm not going to throw a percentage, but let's just, for the fun of it, say 70% of your gut flora is the same as mine and the same for us and between you two as well. So there's an awful lot of gut flora that humans share because it's part of us just being a human. And then on top of that, there's all other kinds of gut flora in your garden that get in there through various reasons or sometimes from a pathological perspective, like when you have a candida overgrowth and that will basically, it's like having Japanese hogweed in your garden and it's just going to go all over everything don't matter that your prize roses or your vegetable bed was there it ain't anymore it's just Japanese not weed not all weed Japanese not weed everywhere and it's you know and you know when we see those people they're the people with you know significant digestive disorders so you know either extreme food intolerances or just failure to thrive at all on any kind of nutrition depending on how far down that spectrum they are mm -hmm. and this is now a really important emerging science so if you want to go out and start to research this you'll find some really interesting mind-blowing stuff out there about human microbiome okay um, and basically it, it boils down to that you are what you eat because you know, there are more cells in that biome than you have as a human in your whole body. So actually you are more bacteria than you are a human right now. You're just a vehicle moving this bacteria from A to B. You're just a vehicle that allows that bacteria to find food and eat it, okay? Now that bacteria, just like any garden, changes its nature depending on how you look after it. So if you're a big carbohydrate eater, you will favor certain types of microbacteria in your gut to digest that carbohydrate okay and part of the side effect of that is that they'll produce a lot of gas a lot of bloating a lot of irritation there's there's repercussions you know so um quite often you see you've seen that body type of blokes particularly <clears throat> they they always look like they're a snake that swallowed an egg <laughs> Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They're quite skinny limbs and yeah. legs, but then they have this real nice round belly. Mm -hmm. You know, and I see some of those guys that they'll come in and they'll say to me, you know, I want to get fit and we use, lose this fat. And I'll say to them, that's not fat. That's bloating. That is basically your intestines are inflamed, right? Just like if you had your thumb, you banged it with a hammer, boom, boom, boom. your intestines are doing that. Mm -hmm. And so therefore your nutrition for you is completely wrong. It's completely wrong. You're eating stuff which is just, you know, causing all that inflammation. So, you know, the way forward in that is, there's lots of different ways, but one of the best is exclusion. So you just come off everything and then you slowly reintroduce stuff and then you'll find out what, what triggers it. And I did that myself many, many years ago and found out that, you know, I'm wheat intolerant. And it was profound. I never thought I was. I went all through my dance career, my whole life, and I enjoy a lovely sandwich. <laughs> you know, nice big tiger bread, <clears throat> lovely sandwich. And the moment I came off the wheat, uh, and it's not gluten specifically, because I could eat oats and I wouldn't feel that. Came off the wheat, honestly, I felt totally different. I mean, like, energy bouncing off the walls. But I thought that was largely because I'd given up loads of stuff. So then I reintroduced the bread. You know, literally within hours, I'm on the loo. I've got bad stomach ache. I'm bloated. So I go, 
okay, let's do that again. I must have done it three or four times just to convince myself I wasn't just making this up or it was something else. So when you, sorry, mate, when you said you removed everything, you mean carbohydrates or... Well, so no, you just it, right. So where where do you where do you what do you no, keep? No, you just in? go on a fast. You'll go on a, a fast for a couple of days, and you just okay. clean the system out. Right. So you can have so your mint nothing. tea and your green yeah. tea or whatever, you know. Um, but largely, you know, I mean, there are some things that there's never any real, very definite, concrete guidelines on these things because some people will say when you're doing the fast, it's okay to have this, whatever. And then other people say, no, you've got to have absolutely nothing. And you kind of just go, what can I tolerate? Mm -hmm. So I just kind of just went, I'm just not going to eat anything, but I'm just going to drink green tea and keep my hydration up and we just do that, Mm -hmm. which is what I did. And I I did it for like two days. Mm -hmm. um, And then just one at a time introduced different foods and see what happened. And like, again, largely no real response except for when I had bread or pasta, any of that. So it's wheat, basically, for me. And it wasn't like I was, um, you know, like some of the clients I've had or athletes I've worked with, which um, have real bad, you know, then end up in hospital. So it wasn't like that, but it was enough to just be. But what happens is with these things, you tolerate them. You learn to live with that. So loads of people are walking around with, you know, distended abdominal discomfort and they'll just live with it, man. They won't even realize they've got it. And they'll just live with that. And it's only when you, you know, take them off s- certain things and they just come back and go, it's been a liberation. I've been seeing the doctor for years getting medications for yeah. this and that, di- diarrhea or constipation, or I never seem to. I think so many it. people, though, are used to those foods, aren't they? You know, yeah. yeah. Just are so used to eating bread, eating Habitually. this, eating eating takeaways well, rubbish food fast food well, the you government's know. fucking healthy yeah, you know, oh, healthy yeah, eating play doesn't help does it let's be honest what no it's is. absolutely nonsense <laughs> yeah. but the, the thing is I mean to be honest with you this has become the biggest thing for me um, with everybody over the last sort of four or five years it's been so profound so I've brought you some good references here that I would strongly encourage people to go and look at um, YouTube largely this stuff's on but that's just because you know, it's there, easy to access. That's what's so easy to access, isn't it? Mm. And it? But some of this is, you know, I mean, all of this actually that I'm going to tell you is quality because it's not just American. It's not just an American uh, high school student with an opinion. These are scientists, they're doctors, they're researchers, they're people with validity, and they will give you the references to go and look at the validity. So this is a huge subject. We might want to come back and visit this another mm, time maybe, and really yeah. dig apart. But I'll just give you a a brief kind yeah, of please all right so um you know the point really for me fundamentally is you'll never you know this you know this you you never out train the diet that's wrong you know that it's an industry standard everybody says you know various ways of putting that but if your diet ain't right you're wasting your time with you are literally your wasting program your time. literally wasting yeah. your time i said to all my clients so yeah. if they don't get that right there's no point even paying me any money absolutely so whether you're trying to rip down if you're going home and going that was a hard session smashing a pizza that's more calories than you just burnt off that ain't gonna work if you're just you know smashing out you know one rep maxes bum 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 and you're expecting to just get huge not unless you feed the body the protein and the aminos that it needs to replace the muscle mass so we know that that's you know kind of 101 really but dig a bit deeper in that because um really everything that you've been told about diet and nutrition as you just alluded to particularly from a mainstream medical perspective is lies and bullshit you know um and i feel really angry uh, you know properly about how much we get manipulated because yeah all right you, you spoke about my diet i'm a committed carnival you know i eat only meat I, i'm not keen on organs so I don't really, I'm not kind of, yeah, yeah, real kind of, or they see me as a bit of a wuss because I just yeah. eat. You're, like, not, you're, not, not, you're not the liver king. I'm not the liver king. I'm not Pumping on steroids. Your, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> and then, then a year later, Paris comes back on to do his yeah. admittance. Yeah, stuff. yeah. <laughs> yeah I've, I've been on him. For That's what my hair fell out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, I'm not. Uh, I do eat occasional bits of liver, but I'm not really. So they'd see me as a bit of a wuss because they're like, oh, you're not even eating raw liver. You can't call yourself carnival. Uh, all right, then. I'm not a carnival, but, you know, I eat meat. 
and I also eat dairy um, and I have uh, nuts and then occasionally a couple of times a week I'll have a handful of blueberries mm. I haven't eaten any vegetables in over four years um, how do you feel on it? I feel fantastic uh, I when feel you great. switched over did you feel an instant? Uh, no like, or was it like a gradual thing that you feel no, like your health got think better? no I think around about the time that I you know went on that week sort of discovery thing and then came off that and then I just went get rid of carbs anyway mm -hmm. so I was like I'd say it was VLC very low carbohydrate occasionally literally occasionally but like once a month I'd go oh I need a pizza or something so I would I would kind of do that yeah. well gluten free but yeah. you know even then I'd sort of go oh I wanted that but now uh, you know so then about three years ago I made the decision that I was just going to go that's it I'm going carnivore because I've read enough about it and I'm convinced about this and I'm going to do it properly because I don't do things unless you do it properly so I was about to say do you use condiments or anything like that? I, I hear some people go on oh, carnivore and then have ketchup and <laughs> you know what I mean no no I don't have any ketchup yeah. I'm not that thick <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, no 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 but that's so a good point so many people do don't they they go yeah, oh no, I'm doing the, carnivore and then they have 100 grams of carbs a day in ketchup yeah, and shit you know the, because, and as you said a moment ago about habitual consumption you know the first point that I do with any any client is first thing I want you to do before we even think about changing your diet is I want you to read the labels that's it just every single thing that you buy now go and read the label and you know even get my mum and dad who are you know they're elderly pensioners and they go well oh, arthritis and they got all this stuff you know that you get when you're older apparently um, read the labels and it was a massive eye opener for them to go get this you know bacon right well that's carnivore that's keto right it's, it's got glucose syrup in it if you read the packet they sneak sugar in it mm. so you've got to buy if you're going to have bacon you've got to read that label you've got to find the ones and you'll probably find one like naked bacon where they haven't messed around with it mm. so the whole food industry is all geared around selling you a bunch of crap because number one is they want you addicted to it. And number two is that they just want it, you know, to fly off the shelves. And there also there's a, there's a third thing, which is, to me is a, it's a bit sinister. And then we could look at global kind of, um, uh, what's the word? Um, I can't think of it. But anyway, the same companies that own the food industry mm. also own big Weight pharma. Watches. <laughs> and mm. So what they want to do is they want to, they want to get you a lifetime of highly processed shit food that causes inflammation in your body that will give you Alzheimer's, high blood pressure and diabetes. And then they want to sell you the medicines to fix those things. So That's a rabbit hole though, isn't it? There's so much of Kind that, of is a rabbit there, hole, yeah. but it ain't for me anymore because I just went, penny drop, step out of it. You just step out of it. If you can get your head around it and you just go, not me, right? That's not me. You are not having me. Mm -hmm. That's what I do. And I, to be honest with you, I, I don't find it difficult anymore. Yeah. I, just, I just don't. Yeah, I, I, I kind of I hear a lot of what you're saying, but I think just thinking about the everyday person, I think that's where they struggle, isn't it? Because it's just the organization and everything else that's involved with actually adhering to that type of way of life. Yeah. And I think people obviously rely on convenience food, which we you know is ultra processed and, and full of shit. And it's fucking emotional, man. Yeah. Like people get the working shit jobs, yeah. nine till five, come home, oh, yeah. what, what do I yeah, have? Yeah, oh, vicious, crisp, chocolate, yeah, it's shit, a cycle. which is fine. You know, I mean, I'm not here to. I'm not. No, yeah. yeah. No. In a sense, I'm here to preach to the converted. In the sense, yeah. like, because you know, I find that the people, if you like, that. I find that I work successfully with are the ones that are on the precipice. Yeah. They know oh, this yeah. is wrong. They want to live to watch their sons grow up and play football and that. And then they go, I'm ready for it, mate. Yeah. What have I got to do? Because most of the information I'm looking at is conflicting in the press. Have this diet, do that diet. You should eat carbohydrates. I mean, I completely agree with you, by the way, with all this stuff. Like, oh, it's yeah. not, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I, I agree with exactly what you're saying with um you know especially food labels everyone should fucking read a food label Absolutely. one of my clients um they, they're a bit older they were 70 and uh i've got them on the low fat mayonnaise just a calorie control and stuff like that and um her their daughter told her told them told her to switch to vegan mayonnaise 
Have you ever seen? Have you seen the calories and and what's in a vegan mayonnaise? So I didn't I didn't realize. So they only told me this recently. They was putting on weight week on week. Yeah. So when it was like 50 grams of extra low-fat mayonnaise with their tuna, for example, they were putting in vegan mayonnaise. Well, in 100 grams of vegan mayonnaise is 664 calories. Compare that to the extra light, which is 54. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm not... So, even, so listen, like, like that... So they, but they thought they, would do, they were eating healthier. I'm going to shoot, was, I'm gonna shoot you healthy. down here. Go on I mean, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go on because there. I don't care about calories. Calories aren't the issue. I mean, I would... We could sit down, me and you, and oh, I might we could, well yeah. consume more <laughs> calories than you, all right? Yeah, well, me, because my, be, yeah. my meat, it's got loads of fat on it. I mean, I'm literally eating butter Who's that? Who's that doctor that's talking about that at the moment? There's a doctor who was on the Stephen Bartlett podcast, and he was talking about um, quality of calorie over calorie counting. Not all calories are equal, you see. The point is that calories are irrelevant, all right? Now, but what I want to pick up on is the pertinent point in your story, which is that they switched to um, vegan mayo, okay? Now the biggest issue switching to vegan mayo is now you're dealing with a vegetable oil based product. Now vegetable oils are going to kill you, all right? Vegetable oils, I refer you to Nina Takeholtz, all right? And you'll find a, again, I'll give you these references. Go and watch. Tonight, when you go home, watch <laughs> Nina right. talk about the bullshit of the vegetable oil industry, okay? You'll find it on YouTube. Just sit yourself down you, and watch it. Do you know when you were saying about calories are not, not correct, as in to, to follow calories? I think the, the big issue with that is, is saying that to a regular person who's at home, and then they're trying to, trying to sort out their diet, trying to sort out this. They, they may not understand that you know, it is important to track calories, to lose weight if they are not eating the right foods is is that what do you know what i mean i'm gonna i'm still gonna argue with you so, so i mean i know you want to put like that you know what message i'm saying yeah, i do people, i do people will, people will listen to but, this and they'll go oh you know if if quality of calories are important like i've had i've <laughs> maybe you got about this all day but like i've um i've had clients before that have uh, followed slimming world for example and slimming world have free foods so then I think eggs were a free food. I had a really severely over, overweight client and he, he ate like 10 eggs a day because they were free. Yeah. And then he wasn't losing any weight because he was eating that on top of all of his other stuff. Exactly. So my, my, that, 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 that is the key point. That that's what I was trying to say. See, so, I eat at least 12 eggs a day. 12 eggs a day? Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? Not really. I love <laughs> eggs, you know, and they're a huge, I mean, they're a, an essential thing, but why don't I get fat? Well, this is, yeah, that's what fascinates me. Because that's why I'm, I'm an adapted fat burner, you know, that I went through my process of, yeah. of, of changing from being a sugar burner to a fat burner, all right? And now I'm a fat burner. So I can literally eat as much fat as I want to eat. Not only does it make me healthy and keep my brain active and alive because those fats are essential for myelination of the neurons, right? So it will avoid Alzheimer's. But... I use that fat as my energy system. I don't eat any sugar. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that's what Never. the ketogenic diet is, isn't it? It's, it's switching the systems, which, again, I understand. It is, yeah. I just think as uh, putting it out there to the general public, I think that's what people would struggle with. I think if they all got into that mindset of not counting calories, then there would be... There, there's a lot of uneducated people in, in so No, no, many I get that. Ways. It's about so, making it as simple as you that's can what I mean, so that yeah. people can go, right, let me follow you. So the, my approach is to stay completely away from any of that because people become obsessive about calories and they start counting this and they offset that and it's blah, 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 and they get totally confused by it and ultimately, in my experience, it doesn't really work out for them. It's very complicated and it's hard oh, work. It and it's so the basis of a lot of eating disorders, I've got, I, I will give you the simplest kind of plan that you could possibly do to follow and I guarantee you it will work. And they go, yeah, I want that. And I go, okay, there's only two types of fuel you can burn. You know, you're either petrol or diesel. And at the minute, you're a carbohydrate sugar burner, and that's petrol. And what we need to do is to turn you into a fat burner, and that's diesel. And you will run all day on your fat, and you won't have your insulin spikes, and you'll get rid of all your inflammation, recover from your injuries quicker, and you won't be anywhere near as hungry during the day as, like, I haven't eaten today, all right? I've got my bits of meat in my bag, but I'll eat them probably after this rather than during. But I'm not hungry at all. 
I could just go all day and some days I don't eat at all. So I do do fasting, but I don't do fasting as a, as a protocol. I just don't eat because I'm not hungry. And once you switch to being a fat burner, you know, what you'll do is your body will go, do we have any fat? Because we haven't eaten today. Oh, I found a bit here. Let's, let's use that then until he gives us more, you know. But if you've got fat and you're eating sugar, mm-hmm. and carbohydrates are sugar, obviously, yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. complex yeah. sugars, then you just store the fat for the rainy day. Well, yeah, and you just burn the sugars. Is, boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom. I know you know it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's my way of trying to get it across to people about forget about calories because you know the sugar calories are super high but then your fat calories can be super high so if you're trying to think i'm trying to balance calories let me tell you if you're eating any fat at the same time that you're eating sugar or carbs you'll store that fat so you ain't going to lose weight so what you've got to do is get your head around that you if you want to change really you need to give up you need to become fat adapted okay now that doesn't mean that you have to devote the rest of your life to live in a ketogenic lifestyle because once you become fat adapted you can include the occasional pizza or whatever it is that you want to have but then you're making the choice to have that at a time that's appropriate rather than habitual eating so you just switch you know you switch the whole energy system that the body's utilizing to the authentic energy system that evolution has designed you to thrive on, which is meat. So you, do you add, I know you said you have blueberries. Do you, would you add fruit to that if people wanted to add fruit? Yeah, I mean, again, I, um, my own personal beliefs and also the readings are that, um, you know, our ancestors, again, were That's why I said it. Yeah, opportunistic. Fruit, yeah. So, you know, in the summertime, they're out trying to hunt you know, uh, an antelope. They're a bit hungry because they haven't caught it yet. And they come across a, a bush of berries. Well, they're not going to walk past that. They'll, they'll eat the berries. But they're not going to eat, like, those berries and stuff themselves every day all the way through the winter as well. There won't be any berries. So I think, you know, having the berries is acceptable from a, an evolutionary perspective, from a gut microbiome, for an energy system perspective. But it's also the that... Exactly. But it's also that the research clearly shows, and again, I can send you the reference, but this is out just recently, that half a cup of blueberries is equivalent anti-inflammatory to average ibuprofen that you buy at the chemist. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's that profound. I think we're discovering more and more about all this stuff, though, in there, in there as, as it's going. We're, 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 you know. I say we're probably rediscovering it. We're rediscovering <laughs> yeah. how far we've moved away from this amazing machine of a human body and how far we've drifted from the environment that that was crafted to fit into so perfectly. I tried the ketogenic diet when I was in lockdown. The only thing I found was I felt a little bit, my workouts were a little bit flat. Have you ever experienced that when you first started? Is that maybe just a switch over or, you know, I just felt I like did, the, first, yeah. the first week or so I felt mm. great, two weeks I felt great. And then probably by the time I got to fourth, I was a bit like, you know what I mean? Like I was a real slog to get, is, does that pass? If you was to, if I was to have stuck with it, I didn't stick with it, obviously, because I was, I, I struggled more Moving so again. with. I'll come back. <laughs> Sorry, I, I struggle with just more so the um, the adherence really of just having meat and you know I I, I craved pizza. Yeah, does your does your other half follow the same diet? She's vegan. Interesting. That is really me and my son are carnivores. My wife yeah. and my daughters, um, vegans. Okay, and. You know, are they, are they moral vegans? Because they, yeah, the yeah, moral okay. vegans. Okay. The reason I was asking is because I, 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 I think for most people, if their family or their social network don't have a similar lifestyle, it's hard for them to adhere to it. But that's interesting. It's you know, it's not again from my perspective, it's not even hard. Mm-hmm. And then one of the other aspects, I mean, again, there's so many things we touch on in this, and. I knew there would be. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's you right, know, right. <laughs> this is like hours and hours and yeah, hours. Yeah. But mm. is trying to get men, again, going back to our, say, BJJ, 40 to 60-year-old guy, to actually re-engage with their relationship with food from a perspective of making, making food. You know, to the extent where I've actually brought in my two-ring gas cooker and I've run a little session and 
you know, got various clients in and gone, let's make some food, you know, because they've either got into the habit of their partner providing their food, they sit down and there it is, I'm serving it to you. Um, or they were just never taught how to make some food, how to cook a good steak, how to make scrambled, scrambled eggs or just whatever, food preparation, you know, just, and I, even if my wife had the same diet as me, I still wouldn't, you know, want on a regular basis kind of thing, her to make all my food because my relationship with my food is really quite profound. I, I'm not religious, but I make my food and I, I sit there and I look at it and I go, check out that piece of steak. And then it's got, you know, just some mustard on it and my scrambled eggs have got a bit of cheese in it. And, you know, it's just the way that I've made it and the love that I've put into it is gonna come back to me. So, you know, beyond and above, somebody in a factory pulling a lever which squirts some stuff in a package that is full of chemicals and you buy it and you eat it you know i mean that's what we're saying when we say read the labels what is this it's a load of chemical crap and the, almost like the other the extreme end other end of that spectrum is you having the food in your hands and making it and sitting down and you, you feel like a hunter-gatherer. You feel like, I mean, you are, like the next step is going out, wrestling the cow and killing it and eating it, which I'm not prepared to do at this stage. But I, lo I love listening to this because it's such a, it's such a, uh, a one side of the view. And then you can make the argument for the other side. So like the veganism and the, the people who are vegans are passionate vegans. Um, and then they'll come up with data and they'll come up with you know their side of the story and it's just i just always find it really fascinating to to hear like you know which side and why and and whatever and i always find i'm i'm pretty much in the middle yeah. <laughs> it sounds like you know what i mean i'm, I'm very much I, I love meat i love meat I, if i i'd say 70 percent of my diet is is meat you know but i love fruit and i do love veg you know it's not a, not a bad thing and uh but i understand what you're saying with the um the inflammation there's a lot of vegetables that i eat that I don't eat anymore because of inflammation so you know so again it's one of those things where i completely understand where you're coming from and but then at the same time i can watch something else and i can i can understand where they come from at times yeah but that's science isn't it but yeah i i i've never gone to i guess the extreme of a carnival diet but i used to certainly eat, eat very high protein low carb and always got very good results on that um and i guess if anything it was more like a paleo diet um yeah. to, to, to kind of coin it but I know we had a GP on um, one of our earlier episodes. Um, we didn't get into talking about it because we didn't have time, but he was very, he's not a vegan as such, but he felt that all the research pointed in that direction. <laughs> yeah, so did. Yeah, it almost that. depends where you look, doesn't it, as you say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It really doesn't. We could talk all day, mate. And I kind of want to, but... You've only just warmed up, come on. Yeah, I know. <laughs> But yeah, I think sadly we are going to have to wrap it up there, mate. I, I wish we didn't, but we are going to run out of tape. Um, okay. But it's been fascinating. Um, and we will definitely share all of the uh, the references where people can have a good read and make their own decisions on it. Um, and yeah, we'd love to get you back on and, and talk some more about all this stuff, mate. And we didn't even touch on the uh, sort of psychology and the, you know everything else that we wanted to get through as well. Yeah, and we didn't even really touch on, uh, you know... BJJ, the, <laughs> the implications for shoulder health, what things you could do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I wanted to ask you about your swimming stuff as well, but yeah. I guess maybe we just do a part two. <laughs> yeah. Just do a part yeah, two. it's loads. Yeah. I mean, this I knew this would be an issue because for me, these points that we talk about yeah. are really the fundamentals, and they need to be part of the consideration. Yeah. So even if you are looking at shoulder health for BJJ, I'm going to hit you with what you're eating mm -hmm. because all the inflammation that you take a joint to the end of range and your pain receptors firing off that's why you tap out mm -hmm. and if you want to protect that repeated trauma you've got to minimize inflammation in your body goes back to nutrition <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brilliant. yeah well, well thanks bro paris pain part yeah. one in the bag part two coming <laughs> soon cheers mate thank, thank you mate. real it. pleasure thanks guys